will be switching about the halfway through the presentation. Um, yeah, we'll be talking about uh, CloudFork and the concept of uh, cloud computing and how we, how we can uh, use it from uh, within the portal. Um, we'll start off by uh, talking about uh, uh, the Cloud Fork library uh, Amazon and I developed and about the concept of cloud computing and what, uh, what you can use it for. After that, uh, Ernest will talk about the uh, active item, something we built on, on top of uh, the Cloud Fork library. He will give a demo. And after that, we'd like to have a discussion with you about how there are three very common ways to do cloud computing. Uh, one is uh, software as a service, uh, that means you use an existing software program on the internet. Uh, Salesforce.com is a very common example. Uh, yeah, also Gmail, you can also see Gmail as a software as a service. Um, the other one is a platform as a service. Um, that is a platform where you can host your software and run it uh, on the internet. And you don't have to worry about uh, scalability and backup, etc. The platform takes care of, of you for that. Uh, the uh, Google App Engine is a, is a good example of that. And they support uh, Python and uh, Java. And uh, a third uh, type is infrastructure as a service. And that's a bit more low level, and then they give you uh, yeah, pieces of infrastructure you need, uh, for example, uh, yeah, computing power, but also databases, messaging systems, storage, and then it's up to you to combine these infrastructure elements to have a, a, yeah, a good architecture and, and a working system. And that was a short introduction to uh, cloud computing. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, what, what is CloudFork? Uh, CloudFork is a, a library in Smalltalk which, uh, well, the ambition is to, uh, to give access to uh, the cloud computing APIs uh, uh, from within uh, Smalltalk, so to make those interfaces available. Um, yeah, we developed it in, uh, in Squeak and in Faro. Uh, we developed it in such a way that it can easily be ported to other Smalltalk dialects. We've already ported it to uh, VisualWorks and VA Smalltalk. Um, we looked at uh, the way the, the Seaside code was structured. And, so we learned a lot about how you can make uh, a portable software library or portable Smalltalk library. And it's open source and it's hosted uh, on uh, Squeak Source. And in the, the, well, we started uh, December last year in the current version. Well, there's a lot of cloud, cloud computing services available on the internet, but there's one that you could say a uh, market leader, or, and that's uh, Amazon, the Amazon Web Services. So we're not talking about uh, the bookstore of Amazon, but the cloud, cloud computing services of Amazon. We focused on those services. Um, well, Amazon uh, nowadays has a, has a lot of uh, uh, different cloud computing services and well, when you look at Amazon, it's really uh, infrastructure as a service. So, uh, they, they don't give you a complete running application, they don't give you an application server, they give you pieces of infrastructure that you can use and those pieces are yeah, very uh, simple and efficient, but it's up to you to combine them into something useful. Well, we focused on the, uh, the, 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 the most well-known and most used uh, services. It's a, it's a storage service called uh, S3. It's a messaging service called SQS. It's a database service called SQLDB. And um, we started on uh, yeah, the, the pure hybrid startup of virtual machines. Uh, that is not small to virtual machines, but uh, operating system virtual machines, and they call that uh, the Elastic Computing Cloud, EC2. Uh, well, uh, all those uh, services from Amazon have, have a lot in common. They, they are built upon the same uh, architecture and the same business model. Uh, well, talking about the business model, um, well, you, you don't, if you want to use those services, you don't have to pay anything up 
upfront. You don't have to pay fixed amounts per month or per year. You only pay for what you use, and you don't have to uh, yeah, pre-register or pre-reserve anything. You can just start using the service, and at the end of the month, you will receive a report with exact, exact usage details and the dollar amount that you that will be deducted from your credit card. Uh, well, all those uh, infrastructure services, that, you know, Amazon uses them internally for their own systems, and yeah, they've been a pretty successful uh, online internet store for about 10 years, so they learned a lot about uh, yeah, what is a scalable architecture, um, and all those lessons learned they put into their uh, infrastructure components. Um, I was at the QCon conference about uh, three years ago. I, I heard a speech from Werner Vogels, that's the uh, CTO of Amazon. He explained a lot about the, the architecture behind the Amazon infrastructure. Um, yeah, it was a pretty complex story. Um, I can't tell you the, uh, all the details, but uh, very important is the. Um, well, they, they don't use uh, real transactions in the asset form because uh, the theory is they, they don't scale enough. They don't scale to uh, Amazon scale. There's a theory, it's called the CAP theory. And CAP stands for uh, Consistency, Availability and Partitioning. And uh, well, in, the, in the ideal system you would like all three, but the theory says you can only have two out of three. That means if you want to do transactions, you have a limit to your partitioning, to your scalability. Well, Amazon needs to have huge scalability, so they said we'll compromise a little bit uh, on the consistency, so we can scale forever, so we can scale in to like a straight line. And it means they'll, instead of being always consistent, instead of having the asset properties, they say it will be eventually consistent. That means it's a highly distributed system, and not, not all nodes have the exact same information at the exact same time. There can be delays in many seconds, etc. When hardware fails or when network lines go down. But the system is designed to handle the, the, those failure situations. Because we have the downtime is absolutely the, the worst thing you could have. And it's, it's better to have a, uh, data that is inconsistent for a few milliseconds than to have your system down because you're using distributed transactions. Um, well, of course, the services can, uh, can be accessed from all over the world. They actually are hosted in the US and in, the, in Europe and Ireland. Uh, the services have an interface. Um, you can choose, they, they offer a, a soul based interface and a REST based <coughs> interface. Uh, we opted for the REST based interface, and you already see. Yeah, that's about what 95% of the customers do. You always see some features which are not accessible or very hard to use using the SOAP interface. So it's a good advice to stick to the simpler REST interface. And the last point, um, well, the, the infrastructure components are usually scalable. You can put uh, terabytes of data in it and, and put it under a lot of load and it will work perfectly. But they tried the only thing, the only way they could accomplish that is by keeping things simple. So the, they are not very complex APIs, they are pretty straightforward. And the whole philosophy behind the architectures is to keep it simple. Yes? Uh, well, um, I don't know if you're interested, but the, it, to give you an indication about uh, the prices, uh, the pricing model is pretty fine-grained. Um, well, you have to pay, for example, the, the top row uh, storage. You have to pay an amount for the amount, amount of data you store per month, fifty dollars cents, and you have to pay for uh, yeah, network traffic, data coming in and going out, and a very small amount for for the number of of API calls you do. And it's, it's very similar for the other services. EC2, you have to pay per CPU hour. You can rent a very small virtual machine, which is pretty cheap. Uh, or you can rent a really big one with uh, 64 bits and 30 gigabytes of RAM. And, uh, then you have to pay a bit more. 
And most of the virtual machines have, have uh, some kind of a Linux version OS installed, but it's also possible to rent the uh, Windows server, and then you have to pay a little bit extra for the Microsoft uh, license. But it's also pay as you use, we don't have to buy separate. Uh, okay, now a bit of details about the S3, the storage server. Um, well, the concepts they use are uh, op uh, buckets, objects and keys. A bucket is uh, yeah, like a large uh, container, really unlimited in size. And you can store uh, objects, which are really blobs, binary large objects. They can be up to 5 gigabytes in size each. And uh, an object is stored under a key, just like this Smalltalk Dictionary. Um, yeah, and by giving the key names with the uh, forward slashes in them, you can, so you can simulate a file system, but it's not really a file system. Um, each object can have uh, metadata attached to it, and for the concept of metadata, they really use the HTTP protocol, and uh, the headers you put in, into the HTTP message become the metadata. So for, think for example of the uh, content type, <coughs> Uh, or the amount of cash, uh, cash information, or you can also put your own custom information in there, like <coughs> customer ID or something. Um, yeah, it, S3 also is a kind of, a, you can see it as, a, as an HTTP server for static content. Um, if you make your, all your data publicly accessible, you can easily uh, host an, uh, an HTML website on there. Uh, of course, you can make really big files on there, like uh, like HD movies or something. And yeah, nowadays a lot of streaming is done via HTTP, so your customers can uh, uh, watch watch the movie, and you don't have to worry about scalability. If you have two viewers, it's okay, but if you have uh, two hundred thousand, then it's no problem. Except you have to pay the bill for it. <coughs> Um, if you have a lot of software to distribute, uh, you can do that via S3, but if you do it normally, yeah, you, you will have a large bill. But you can use the BitTorrent protocol to, uh, to lower the bill considerably, because then uh, the, the software will get distributed peer-to-peer, -peer, and not only from, uh, from your AMS account. And it has, uh, each object has an access control list, so you can say it should be publicly accessible, it should be private, or you can use groups to give certain people uh, reading and or writing rights. <coughs> um, well, now, the, uh, now you can use the S3 API uh, from Smalltalk, uh, yeah, of course, to, uh, to look at what, what objects you have in your bucket, uh, to store objects in your bucket, and to read objects from your bucket. This simple example uh, where it creates a new bucket, uh, opens it, uh, yeah, puts a very small object in it, a uh, string uh, with a key and a tweet, and it, uh, it reads it back. And well, now we, we uh, see that it's a string, so it will get a content type of uh, text, uh, plain, text plane, uh, and yeah, that's it really. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, on to the, to the messaging system. Uh, well, uh, you can use a messaging system for uh, asynchronous uh, communication. Uh, it's, it's really ideally suited for, uh, for load balancing uh, uh, work you have to do. For example, I, I had a, a site which uses a lot of media files which should be transcoded. And sometimes it's not busy and uh, yeah, I, I can use a single PC to do the transcoding, but sometimes it's very busy. <coughs> I need to do a lot of transcoding. Uh, well, if I use, if I just put all those transcoding jobs in a queue, and I look at uh, the amount of jobs in the queue, and I say, oh, I need to start another uh, virtual machine process doing the transcoding. It, it, it's really easy to set up, and it's really easy to scale. And uh, yeah, the, the messaging system is, is a very important element uh, for that. Um, for now, the queues, you cannot use them to communicate with external parties, uh, or you, you could do it, but you would have to give them your 
private, uh, login credentials. So probably not a good idea. <coughs> there currently they are only private, but they're thinking about adding a kind of access controllers to these jobs, to these queues as well. Messages uh, need to be pretty small, about uh, eight, of eight kilobytes. So if you need to transfer something big, you have to store it on S3 and just put the, the key to the to the big object in the, in the message. And yeah, we talked about the beginning that uh, the AWS services are non-transactional. It's obvious they operate over HTTP, so the transaction would be very hard. But for messaging system, it it sometimes is a problem. So you cannot use it for everything. I wouldn't use it, to, for example, to transfer money. Okay. Um, yeah, simple example, uh, very similar to S3. But now uh, we create a queue, uh, we open the queue. Well, no, in most situations, the queues are already there, of course. Uh, well, you could send messages uh, and receive messages. Uh, that's really simple. Um, the receiving and use, uh, well, you have to, to poll for new messages. Uh, but if there, you can say, I want uh, a 20, if there are more messages available, you can have, for example, receive 20 messages in one receive of place. What happens when there is no message? Um, you immediately return. Uh, SimpleDB, um, well as the name says it's a, uh, it's a database system but it's a simple database system. It's, uh, it's not relational, it's not object oriented. Um, but it's, it's huge, it can, uh, yeah, uh, you don't have to administer it, um, you don't have to configure it in some kind of complex way to make it scale, you don't have to make indexes, it's all done automatically for you. Um, and from a, well, if you look at it from a small perspective, you can say it's a, it's a very big uh, dictionary. Um, and in SimpleDB you make uh, <coughs> domains, and you can put uh, items in those domains, uh, I think about a billion per domain, and an item uh, yeah, has key value pairs. And, uh, a special characteristic of SimpleDB is that the, the, those values can be, uh, you can have multiple values per attribute. And I think the, yeah, the, these kinds of databases are now becoming more popular. They're sometimes called uh, key value stores. Um, well, of course, they don't give you all the features of a, of a truly relational database or an object oriented database. The, uh, the API is much simpler, but uh, but also yeah, it, it's very easy to scale. On it. If your requirements are not that complex, it's an ideal system. But of course, not not for all situations. If you have complex joins or, or other stuff, yeah, this is not uh, not for you. Um, and this is the only service I think they did that to compete with uh, with Microsoft. That actually is free to use until a certain uh, yeah, amount of, uh, of data and an amount of queries per hour and then only then you have to start paying. It's comparable with uh, the big table from uh, Google. Well, here it's, it's again uh, the structure. So you, for one account you can have uh, up to 100 domains. Uh, well, the domains contain the items and the, the multi-valued attributes. And it's important to know that you, oh, it's, if you work a lot with relational data, you can see ah, domain is something like a table, but it's it's really it's not um, because yeah, the, it's it's a schemaless database, so nothing stops you from putting different kinds of entities in the same domain. And uh, how you how you distribute your data across different domains really has a lot to do with uh, the scalability. Um, for example, you can have a domain for testing, a domain for uh, user testing, and four domains for production. <coughs> and just distribute the data across the domain. Um, again, uh, a simple uh, code example. Um, 
Yeah, here you see we uh, we create a domain, open it. Uh, yeah, we have a, create a small talk class called uh, simple DB item, which is kind of like a, a dictionary. So you can uh, put some data in it and, and you can store the item. Um, and in our code, uh, yeah, we, had, we had some discussion. But what what should be the, the protocol of our objects? Should we Try to make it as small talk like as possible, or should we use the, the Amazon names on a one to one uh, basis? Um, well, I think we, we, we support now both protocols. For it's simple to be with the yeah. two APIs. Yeah. But the, the problem is that you can, you can give a small talk API, but of course the behavior is just a little bit different. So, so sometimes. <coughs> You shouldn't fool yourself if the behavior is different than the protocol should be different. Um, okay. Well, yeah, for the, this is for, the, for the first part, I just have one, uh, uh, one slide. Uh, yeah, I've had experience with cloud computing uh, for about a year, a year and a half now, both from Smalltalk and uh, from, uh, from other languages. And, um, well, I really see it as, as a very good, uh, good concept. Um, yeah, as a company, it can give me uh, a lot of uh, flexibility, no upfront investments. Uh, yeah, I don't have to deal with uh, uh, a hosting company which doesn't understand me. I'm in uh, full control. Uh, I really like that. Um, I think also for the, uh, that there, here's an opportunity for the small talk vendors. Uh, for example, the pricing model is very interesting. Um, yeah, if you have a, if you have commercial small talk implementation, you can make a EC2 images uh, of your small talk for running uh, server applications. And instead of asking your customers to pay a license up front, you can just let them pay as they use. And if the application is successful in the end, you'll you'll earn a lot more. <coughs> uh, but uh, but your customers really don't have to. Have put money up in front to use your product. Um, and of course, you can create best of breed architecture. So, if, for example, uh, you have a seaside application that, that needs to scale. Well, uh, how do you set up the HTTP daemon in front of the small talk? How do you set up the, the sticky load balancing? Uh, well, one person or one company can figure that out and you can publish that image uh, in the, the catalog of images. Are there any small talk related images already in the community and repository? Yes. Uh, I, I have found them. But uh, yeah, you can create something like seaside hosting.st, but then on a uh, much smaller scale. I think it's a very good opportunity for Gemstone to last. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Gemstone, of course. Uh, but SimpleDB is nice, but not, not for everything. Uh, Oracle already sells its databases as e EC2 images. Yeah. Of course, Chamstone can do the same. Uh, well, now uh, <laughs> I'll give uh, Ernest the microphone. services, but soon I saw that SimpleDB could be one kind of persistent solution to, to, to many problems. And um, before I got back to the smaller community, I was doing a Rails application. So I saw a similarity between Rails having the active record approach to mapping objects to a database and um, <coughs> the active record pattern being applied to SimpleDB. So, Next to developing CloudFork, uh, we started implementing something like ActiveItem, uh, ActiveItem and it's really a mapping 
of the ideas of active bracket to simply be. And why do we need a mapping? Well, as Jan already told us, uh, simply be has concept of domain and items. And if you look at the items, the only thing they can store are strings. So there has to be a mapping between an object and something that's a bunch of strings in the domain. So that's the reason that, so that's what I'm trying to solve with the active bracket, an active item, by having mappings between attributes, so, so you can store dates and timestamps and booleans and so on. That's very simple, of course, but let's see how it, uh, how it works. And then, of course, you have something like relations. And although SimpleDB isn't really a database, you still can find a way to map objects. You can, if you say in the active record that every object has an ID, you can store IDs in items. <laughs> so that's what the associations mapping is used for. And then, of course, uh, active record has a very simple API to store objects, and you can save and delete and find. So all this, this concept will then be translated to API calls on SimpleDB. So one, one of the, the highlights, in addition to the active record, is, uh, is uh, I want to have uh, the same DSL as I found in Rails for specifying relations. So people who are familiar with that you can see that it belongs to as many constructs. There's a way to describe how objects are related to each other. An active item framework translates that to the correct um, ID generations and lookups. Of course, there's inheritance. I started with a little bit of validators. But the other uh, interesting part is the domain strategies, sharding. Uh, sharding is what you can use if you uh, want to partition a, a large amount of data. So sharding tells how to store an item in a domain, and it doesn't have to be uh, the one-to-one -one mapping, so it's not really a table, so you can't say, uh, well, I create a domain for every class. Okay, you could do, but then your application can't grow uh, larger than 100 uh, tables or domains. So there has to be uh, one kind of mapping between the object and the domain that will be stored in. Um, at the moment I'm using with just a single domain, but another approach could be based on the item name, to distribute data <coughs> across different domains. So that's part of the active item framework as well. So enough talking. Time to show some code. Okay. No updates. <laughs> so um, I feel that uh, uh, what was the framework? Uh, Tool. I loaded the Cloud4 packages. I should show you the Cloud4 framework. I have an impression. Okay, that's the next page. As you can see, we have uh, the ABS SimpleDB classes um, loaded here. And we have the platform specific part of Cloud4. So every Small token implementation has one package dedicated for implementation of uh, platform specific parts. So you have to think about HTTP, communication, um, encryption, algorithms, XML, parsing, and stuff like that. <coughs> so if you look at the active item framework, you see, sorry? There are, there are a few of them, the HAMAC, yes? Um, well, Amazon really says how you should uh, use the service securely and you have, uh, have the they provide the encryption or how you yeah. can and you can if you, use yeah. the if you, if you send a uh, request to Amazon, you have to encrypt it okay. using your own private keys. So um, to sign the message with your own private keys, you yeah. can use a plain HTTPS or security. So, <laughs> And, like, uh, okay. and you sign your keys using a... Uh, yeah, there it is. It's a H264. So that's being done for you by platform. So if you compose a request, there's a method for uh, creating a signature of that request using the private keys. And you send that signature to Amazon. 
So they know that this request is coming from you. So you can't send objects to somebody else without it. And also, each request contains a timestamp. <coughs> also checked. So it's very important that your clock is right, otherwise all, all uh, messages will fail. Yeah. <laughs> what about the time zone? Yes, you have to send time zone. Yeah, yeah. that was a you know, it's an issue to solve all the small dialects with the support of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. <coughs> so, um, Really, the only, only class you have to know about is uh, the active item uh, class, which will be the, the, the super class of all items. And that's API to, um, to find it, to find all the objects in your domains. And there's another class, is the describer. And the describer object is used to describe how your object will map to items. So that your for instance, uh, you can say that your class has a boolean and date and so on. And this implementation also uses the idea of convention over configuration. So it's trying to figure out um, what um, the classes are of the type of the, of the names you're using. Let me show you the example of a project I'm working on at the moment. Um, to explain what I mean. So this is a project uh, that deals with, uh, it's for it's built for a flight school. Uh, flight school has uh, a lot of um, exams and courses and lessons and a bunch of stuff. And one of the core objects is of course a question because this flight school has a training, <coughs> training part which you have to answer questions for to take exams. And this question class has a description and the description is really the, the DSL part of uh, Active Item. There you describe how the description, how the question uh, knows and has in terms of attributes and relations. So you can say uh, it has an integer weight. And I have to tell it that it's an integer so an active item can do the mapping for me. So it translates the integer to a string and, and back and forth. But the interesting part is that I also have the, the relation DSL. So you can say it has many choices, and uh, four in this case. And it belongs to an object div. And this belongs to, it takes an objective, and it knows, well, objective by convention means that there must be a class called objective. So we can do it here. Something, a nice trick. I look at this. So, um, then there's this, this small rebuild part, see here. And the rebuild part takes the attribute specifications and generates using the refactoring classes two, two methods. So I have the choices here on how to find an objective using the key and the choices and so on. Of this this setup? <coughs> Different mappings. Uh, I, have, I wasn't going to bother you with all this details, but there is a lot of way you can specify relations between objects. So it's the composition, aggregation, and so on. And this is uh, kind of a cheat sheet you can use to describe the relations. And one of the nice things is, for instance, the composition relation, which translates to five questions. It has a composition relation with four choices. But the four choices are not stored as, as the run items in the domain. They are inside the question object. Because of this, it, it is a composition, so it's never be another object referencing them. So you can use. That's what the active item is doing, flatten out the object. So I've, um, so if I have an objective object here. Then it has of course the description and type and so on. And the 
I saved it. And hopefully it should shut through. And the first time it takes a while because the DNS results. So True, it's good. And now you have to believe me that this object is in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And there's a, there's a query API defined in SimpleDB and uh, we use the, the block to expression translation technique to make it available in Smalltalk. So if I, sorry, this must be course. Class. So the object I just stored should be So this, uh, this eyebrow tool is really a, a viewer of this, all the classes of, uh, of, uh, that's using the framework on the left. And this is a way to explore all the, obje all the objects that the store are stored in the domain. So on the top you see this is uh, a user that's stored in the domain ca.sap.test that uses a single domain sharding strategy. That means all objects go to <coughs> one domain. And um, because in the <coughs> items you specify what the types of the attributes are and how the relations are uh, defined, you can uh, <coughs> see all type information on top. And if you go to questions, it's more interesting. There you see that actually the choice is something I can follow. And it shows me the choices that are stored in the item. And if you go back to the question, Um, objectives. So this is this image talking to Amazon getting the data. And although it seems perhaps to you as rather normal behavior, um, the interesting part is you can run this application on an EC2 image close to where a simple B is. And there's two advantages. You don't have the latency anymore. Second, you don't have to pay for communication between easy to and simply be. So it can speed up the application very good. I think because we need time here to discuss the application. No, I don't want to discuss that. Yeah? Question. What's in the offer of spectrum that we use? Ah, okay. 
that would be one of the issues. Is it class four percent supporting net reduce or? Yeah, good question. Uh, Sorry, I didn't understand. This has to do with what we are we going to Sorry. repeat the question. I think the real question was. Uh, okay, I I wanted to okay. know um, whether the net reduce functionality offered by Amazon could be used uh, with small power too. Okay, I'm not aware of the API of map reduce, but uh, it's on my wish list. There it is. I think the, the map reduce works by sending code to Amazon and they then they evaluate it on each element of a big array distributed and they support a variety variety of languages. They, but they don't do not support well, I think that they have oh, supported. Okay. But you could provide the API to use MapReduce with Python from Smartphone. Yeah. You could do that, yeah. of course, but you won't be able to upload the block to yeah. the Okay. Thank you. Yes? Please take over. Yeah, um, okay. Stephen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, I'll get the application. For money, people pay me. Yes. This is the only thing I want. Yeah. They are building two frontends. One is uh, flex based using Glare data services, and one is uh, web frontend using web for that. Okay, it's a commercial project. It's a commercial project. Yeah, but. Maybe because that's something that we should also add. Okay, continue after after you finish. I want to say something. Um, okay. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that, but the Cloud Fork is open source. It's under the MIT license. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, first I showed you how we made the some of the Amazon APIs available from Smalltalk. And Ernest talked about active items, something we build on top of that. Um, yeah, but we, to be honest, we we really haven't done much yet. Uh, yeah, we made external APIs accessible from Smalltalk. That's nice, but that's no big deal really. <laughs> and active item is also nice, but yeah, there there can be more, of course. And yeah, we're wondering ourselves on what what shall we focus on next. Um, yeah, here are some uh, some things we're thinking about. We just want to show them to you and yeah, talk to you about what, what you think would be uh, uh, good to have and what would be really useful. Well, of course, we can. Uh, well, Amazon is, is uh, the market leader now. Uh, uh, Microsoft is also coming along with the Azure platform and a lot uh, a lot of smaller players. Uh, <coughs> Of course, we have the, the Google App Engine, which is a, a very interesting concept, but now, unfortunately, only not for Smalltalk. Uh, but we can focus on, on uh, exposing more uh, functionality from Amazon, which is the really every few months there is uh, something new, we have new features. For example, they now have a kind of uh, auto scaling, including uh, load balancing and monitoring of servers. Um, Currently, it's not so interesting uh, for us, for example, for Seaside, because they don't support uh, sticky sessions yet. Um, CloudFront is also it's a content delivery network, so you can push content if you have if you have really really big site and become really popular all over the world. You can push the content close to your customers. Uh, MapReduce, it's a very specialized algorithm. Uh, to process really big workloads and huge amounts of data in an efficient way. Um, another very interesting thing is the, the payment server. They have a payment server which actually is very flexible. So, for example, the standard EC2 image is uh, $20 cents, or $10 an hour. But if you put your software on, on it, you can rent it for, say, 50 cents an hour. And then Amazon will do the invoicing and 
and how they, of course, they'll take a cut for that, but then the rest of the money uh, you'll receive. That, that's one of their payment solutions. They also have a lot of other payment solutions, and yeah, they're really interesting, but unfortunately, they are only available for people from the US. So that's one reason why we are still ignoring them. <laughs> Salesforce.com is obviously uh, a big software as a service company which you also can deploy your own custom developed applications. Uh, Google has a nice platform, Microsoft is coming. Uh, Sun has a lot of white papers about, uh, about their ideas of cloud computing and virtual private clouds, etc. And now they are bought by Oracle, so we will see what, <coughs> what's going to happen with that. Yeah, we choose to start with them as a cloud because at that time there was no Azure and Amazon was one of the first players. So it's very popular now. Yeah, it's trying to catch up. But for instance, the Google Big Table, for instance, you can only use Big Table from within Google App Engine if you have Python applications. Can you get the microphone? So we would like to uh, use the big table uh, as a as another API in Cloudforge, but that's not accessible from a smaller image. So we have to write applications, deploy them on the app engine, then you can use the uh, big table. And I'm not sure about uh, Microsoft Azure. They have this SQL Server based database. Yeah, of course they focus on .NET, yeah. but I think it's also possible to run other Windows programs, so that there could be a small virtual machine. Okay. But they are they have a, they're in a kind of preview mode, not a production. Um, okay, next slide, please. Well, something we find uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah. I don't use I don't use Smalltalk 100 percent of the time. Sometimes I have to use another language, uh, like, which uh, like Java and Eclipse. And something that is really nice is that yeah, you can develop something in Eclipse, push your right mouse button, and say deploy to the Google App Engine, and then uh, 40 seconds later uh, the application is running in the cloud. And well, we can wait until Google supports Smalltalk, uh, or we can build something ourselves on top of the Amazon infrastructure parts. And then you, know, you have something like Seaside Hosting.st, but then, yeah, on a bigger scale. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I think we will we'll need some help with that because you, know, you have to all, do all kinds of uh, low-level stuff like uh, measuring the amount of bytes that the uh, network traffic that an, an image uh, consumes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's indeed a very interesting idea. Um, going on, um, well, there are some very good and popular uh, frameworks in Smalltalk, everybody knows of course. Um, well, just as Ernest did for Active Item, I think we can also provide, uh, and make SimpleDB a persistency solution for uh, Marit and Peer. Uh, for Peer, it's, it's a content management system. You have uh, structured data, you can put it on uh, SimpleDB, and uh, character data, and blobs, etc., you can install on this screen. Um, another idea is, yeah, you can have a continuous integration server running as a, as a bunch of EC2 servers. So, uh, yeah, you make a 
new version of your code uh, submitted to the education server that will uh, be tested in different configurations, different combinations, uh, and publish the, the test result. Uh, yeah, that is just the, the, the ideas we had. Um, uh, we would like to hear from you what do you find is interesting? Do you have other ideas? Uh, <laughs> who wants to, uh, who has a suggestion? For um, uh, using uh, Google's storage, you could, because it's not available. I don't know if it's really worth doing it, but you could write a small Google app yeah, like that runs approach. there and exports an API to your small yeah. yeah. that, that would be super simple and it gives you storage. Uh, we could even get this program Amazon API. Or? Right, absolutely. <laughs> no, of course, of course. Yeah. And actually, it would be good for everybody. Not just one. Yeah, yeah, okay, but the billing becomes kind of complex then. Well, no, you don't need to... If you want to do it commercially, <coughs> yes. But Google lets you just run an application for free there. Yeah, until you read a certain... Right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So, and then you can give it to somebody to install it on their own app. Yeah. So they care about their billing. Yeah, that's yeah, a good idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, you were mentioning ports, and you can send a post to send and so forth. Uh, are you also maintaining that? Yes. yes. Well, the, the visual work support is, is Anne's maintaining it, I'm maintaining the VA ports. Okay. So it's current on the follow Yes, um, all changes were, we, when we develop things or find bugs, we change the sweep version first, uh -huh. and then we export the changes to the port. So, just slightly behind sometimes, but that's the way we do it. Um, there are a lot of differences in the implementations, but uh, we wrote the same. Currently, you can use SHA2 or SHA265, but they deprecated uh, SH2 because it's less secure. And we already support the 265 on all platforms. Does the S3 bucket code support both new and the old kinds of buckets? You mean the European buckets? Yeah, the European Yes. Password does the reader right for you in the case of fresh words. Right, but yeah. you actually support when you the creation of the bucket, you have some code, you have to Yeah, there is an API you can specify. It should be European buckets, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye